Well, let me start again at the beginning. My apologies to those of you who did hear what I've already said. Um, I wanted to thank Adam Russell for the invitation to come today. I wanted to thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, I have spent the last 35 years studying perception and cognition in preverbal human infants. But today I'm gonna to talk about how developmental science might be leveraged to improve artificial intelligence. So it's a very different line of work, but I've been involved in it for the last several years as I've worked with the people on the Machine Common Sense Program. Um, I was not sure exactly who would be in the audience. Um, I thought some people might actually be on the MCS program and might know a lot of what I'm going to talk about. Some of you might know very little about this line of work. Um, I decided probably the safest thing to do would be to pitch this at the level that you see I pitched it at. Um, my apologies if some of you um, find some of this to be really obvious, um, but I wanted to make sure that everybody listening would be able to follow the conversation. So, um, for instance, I trust that most of you have heard of DARPA, but just in case not, um, that's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. That's the agency that gave us the ARPANET, miniaturized GPS, flat screen displays, brain computer interfaces, all kinds of amazing technology. In 2018, DARPA announced that they would spend over $2 billion to advance AI research. And one of the programs they funded with that money was the Machine Common Sense Program, or MCS. Why? Well, in 2018, it was obvious that AI lacked the common sense that all of us humans take for granted, preventing us from being able to trust it in life and death situations. And the two um, images you see on the left are um, things that I picked up from early presentations uh, back in 2018. But this was um, a picture my wife took in the car we were in um, four days ago, where we were coming down this road, we got to this intersection and our, our intention was to continue going, but the AI told us we should take a right, do a U-turn and get back on. It's still very stupid, even now in 2024. <laughs> That all appeared to change, at least to a lot of people, uh, about 14 months ago when OpenAI unleashed ChatGPT on the world. Suddenly, AI was able to give correct answers to questions that it previously failed on, like these questions about Abraham Lincoln's iPhone. Um, as a result, it started to look to a lot of people not in the AI research community as if AI has something akin to the intelligence we see in adult humans. Now, I know that you all know that chat GPT hallucinates like a hippie, lies like George Santos, but there's a deeper problem. Um, AI continues to lack the kind of physical knowledge that all of us human beings take for granted and that allow us to survive um, in the world. This is the unofficial graphical sigil of the MCS program. Um, it shows a robot not understanding that if it saws on its right side, it's gonna fall out of the tree that's holding it up. Whereas if it saws on the left side, it would still survive. Um, AI is still really far from having the kind of intelligence we see in most human adults. One of the first things we needed to do in the program was to ask the question, what even is common sense? And the MCS teams had a lot of discussion about this and there's been a lot of disagreement. Um, I would say that we never actually came to a final agreed upon definition. But at very least, one thing kind of at the base level, I think we all could agree on is that a system that is intelligent, or at least that has common sense, has to be able to generalize to an infinite range of new tasks and very unfamiliar environments with essentially no retraining and no fine tuning. Now, as I'm sure most of you know, um, the Turing test was a sort of thought experiment described in this 1950 paper by Alan Turing designed to evaluate if a machine had achieved human-like common sense, or sorry, human-like intelligence. But it turns out that the same paper had another really interesting idea. About halfway through the paper, Turing writes, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. And it was 1950, so we're gonna give him a break here. We're gonna assume that what he meant was the adult mind, because presumably you could get something like that from a machine, but you're certainly never gonna get a brain, right? Because it's, the machine's never gonna be this sort of wetware that we have. We give him a break, he's touring. All right, based on this, you can start to see why some people in the AI community might've become interested in talking to developmental psychologists like me. 
So they put out this call for proposals. They got a, a whole bunch of people who were interested in participating in the MCS uh, program. And they ultimately chose four teams to explore how developmental science might contribute to common sense in AI. Three of the teams were um, called performers. Um, the first was made up of researchers from Harvard, IBM, and MIT, and they developed an AI system that they called Cora. Berkeley was collaborating with some researchers at University of Michigan. They came up with an AI system called MESS. Um, in each of these cases, these are acronyms that stand for long, convoluted, specific things that uh, I'm not going to bore you with. Um, we just call them MESS. Um, Oregon State and NYU collaborated to develop a system called OPEX. Each team employed both developmental psychologists and computer scientist engineers. Now, it's important to note that the MCS program was not a robotics program. And so even though some of the teams did do robotics work, that was not the focus of the program. So all of the AI, uh, the AI systems that were developed in the program were simulations contained in laptops, basically. Even so, it's not unreasonable to think of them as kind of artificial babies, in a sense. Um, I was assigned to the fourth team, the evaluation team, and it too was composed of infancy researchers and engineers. Our job was to create what could be thought of as artificial worlds in which the artificial babies could be tested. We were asked to design experiments like those I've done with infants in my Claremont lab for the last 30 years, experiments that could be done to test if the artificial babies were performing how human infants would in similar circumstances. Now, I'm not a gamer, but I know that remarkable advances have been made in computer graphics in the last decade or so. So here's what I imagined when the program got underway, what our artificial world would look like. I thought it was going to be highly detailed, very realistic, and then we'd be able to do really cool tests with babies. Instead, in a minute, I'm going to show you what our world looked like, the one we actually developed to test the babies in. And it doesn't look anything at all like this. Um, I have to give you a warning up front, though, that the AIs that were developed all spend a lot of time spinning around in the room to try to orient themselves. And because the videos I'm going to show you are from the AI's perspective, it might make you a little bit dizzy. If you're getting dizzy, just close your eyes. <laughs> okay. Here's the world we wound up developing. You can see super simple, really stripped down, had some furniture, maybe a, a toy duck, um, had a soccer ball there. Okay. So why is it shaking? Is it because they're walking? Or exactly. They can't yeah. roll? They don't. No, um, all of the AIs did this weird thing where they would do that. Very rare that they would move very smoothly. Um, the I think one of the three teams had less of a jerky movement than the other two. Yeah. It was the reason for that because they wanted to get a context of where all these objects were. What, what was it doing image segmentation and figuring out distance? I, I, I think so. Um, but keep in mind, A, I'm a psychologist. Yeah. B, I'm on the evaluation team. <laughs> so I don't actually know what the AIs were doing. Okay. Um, you're going to need to bring in someone else to give you that talk. And I can steer you to the people who were involved in the program. Um, they did really cool stuff, but that was not what I was doing. Um, so at first I, I saw what we were going to be testing these artificial babies in, and I thought this is not a good situation. But this turns out to be a significantly smaller problem than you might think. Um, and that's because one of the hallmarks of common sense is the ability to recognize the meaning of a situation across examples that are extremely abstracted from the situation they refer to. So here you see two pictures taken from live video of basketball players. These are um, video games, and you can tell that the one on the bottom is not real because the guy's floating above the rim before his dunk shot. Um, and yet no one would ever think that this is anything other than a basketball game, even though it doesn't actually look like a real-life basketball game. Well, if you go back further in time to earlier basketball game instantiations in video games. You could have blockheads playing basketball in the 80s. This is what a basketball game might have looked like. Even earlier, it looked like this. And amazingly, as human beings with common sense, we look at this and we have no problem recognizing that this is a basketball game. So ultimately, the very stripped down environment in which we tested the babies wasn't a problem because we could still get at the kinds of questions we were concerned with. 
Ultimately, my team developed a world full of objects, agents, mechanisms, and room features that were helpful, such as tools, or innocuous, such as furniture, or dangerous, like those holes in the floor that you see in the back there, um, or see that orange stuff um, in the back, that's lava. If the, um, the robot steps in that, it um, gets burnt and dies. Now, our team created the clip that you're seeing here to illustrate these features of our world, but no AI system ever saw a video like this because the AI system is represented by the robot in the clip that you saw at the very beginning. And the AI system never saw itself. The AI only saw things from its own perspective. This is a more omniscient perspective just to give you a sense of the kind of world that we created. Now, humans can often respond appropriately in never before encountered situations. And this is considered by a lot of people to be a hallmark of common sense. So Neil Armstrong figured out how to motivate himself on the moon without any difficulty, even though he'd never before been in that sort of uh, low gravity environment. Even so, in um, our responses in novel contexts, they do reflect our experiences. Neil Armstrong had a lot of experience walking in this kind of environment before he was ever on the moon. And that certainly influenced his ability to translate um, his competence to the moon. So it was not unreasonable for the teams developing the AI systems to ask us for um, training data, for experiences that they could give the artificial babies so that they would not fail our tests. At first, we were not sure that seemed fair. We were a little concerned that they would just start training to the test. But the truth is that by six months of age, human babies have already had over a quarter million minutes of experience with the world. So some sort of experience seemed completely appropriate to give the AI systems. And so in order to help the um, performers train their AIs, we um, had to come up with some way to give them training data. To do this, we developed something called the um, Interactive Learning Environment, or ILE. We conceived of it as kind of like a playroom that looks like this. Um, the idea was to provide the AI system with generic experiences in a world like the one in which they were going to be tested. Um, this was our training room. It included objects, interactions, and mechanisms like those encountered in test trials. And our hope was that this room would support non-goal-directed exploration, the way babies explore their world. Of course, in reality, there isn't really a room anywhere. Our playroom was really just a scene generator, but it allowed the teams to create the training stimuli that their AI systems needed if they were to have any hope in succeeding on our tests. All right, let me describe some of the tests. Um, in some of them, the AI was relatively passive, and that's because infancy researchers often test babies by showing them visual displays and watching to see how long they look passively at those displays. And this is because we found that babies, like adults, typically look longer at things that are unfamiliar to them or that surprise them. And that allows us to infer things about their perception and cognition by measuring a relatively passive behavior such as looking time. So for example, the first test we developed for this program was based on the 1987 demonstration in infants of something called object permanence, which is the understanding that objects continue to exist even when they can no longer be seen. As adults, we all understand this kind of intuitively, but the father of the field of child development, Jean Piaget, did a bunch of research with young children and concluded that children don't really understand this until well after their first birthday. Piaget said that if babies can't see something, they start behaving as if that thing no longer exists. But by using looking time methods that were relatively passive, the 1987 study seemed to show that even young babies have an implicit understanding of object permanence. They would look longer at displays that showed things miraculously disappearing after being occluded. So we developed a test that was analogous to that one that was used to test babies. We showed the AI short video clips of occluders that initially are raised to show that there's nothing behind them. Then objects fall from above and pay attention on the left side, you'll see a cylinder coming down and going behind the occluder. And when the occluder goes up, voila, it magically disappears. If a baby saw this, 
it would likely be surprised because that violates their sense of optic permanence. And so they would look longer at it. They can't talk. So we have to just use looking time for the babies. But for an AI, we can ask it, was that surprising to you? And that was what we did. We basically said, we want you to give us a signal. Is this plausible or is this not plausible? We ran these kinds of tests in numerous ways. Uh, for instance, in the clip you're about to see, you'll see the object moving in depth. And we used clips uh, using different sorts of motion because that allowed us to make sure that the AI systems weren't just exploiting some simple rule that would allow correct responding without really grasping the important concept that objects are familiar. So first, the AIs were trained on the playroom scenario, they'd walk around, see things in the playroom, some, and then without the people knowing about whether this was like a new task that they didn't know ahead of time. You know, the, okay. That was how we thought it should be. Right. Okay. We got a lot of pushback from the performers saying, we need to know more about what the tests were. Right. So we would have the uh, back and forth. And because this was the first test we developed, I think we did tell them more about what was actually going to happen here. But the further we got into the program, we told them less and less. So um, in this next video, you're going to see um, the object is going to move very quickly behind the secluder. And that's because, as you all know, AIs see everything. They see every single frame and every single pixel. Um, I slowed up that last video you just saw for a human being so you could see what's going on. But here's what it actually looked like to the AI. And you see the car disappearing off on the right. When the occluder goes up, you'll see that the car is still there. So there are actually two kinds of violations of object permanence that can occur. Objects can implausibly disappear or implausibly appear. And we made sure to test uh, both of those scenarios. Relying on a similar kind of logic, we tested the AI's understanding. And I'm going to um, use a little bit of anthropomorphic language here because it's hard to know how to talk about it otherwise. I don't think there's any good reason to believe that AIs actually understand anything going on here, but they're, they're behaving as if they do. Um, so we tested the AI's understanding of how objects behave in situations involving a collision because young infants typically behave as if they're surprised when two objects interact in ways that are inconsistent with Newtonian physics. So in the uh, video on the left, you're gonna see a tube roll in from off screen and bump into another tube, setting uh, the blue tube into motion. And that's a plausible scenario. In contrast, in the video on the right, you're gonna see a toy car roll in from off screen. And although it can't possibly make contact with the blue car, because the two cars are in different depth planes, the second car implausibly sets the first car into motion. So again, we're asking the AIs to rate all the different videos as plausible or implausible. In addition to object permanence and collisions, we tested gravity and support understanding, because young infants have been found to have some conceptual competence regarding the effects of gravity and support. So for example, they typically register surprise when an unsupported object doesn't fall to the ground. So to test AI systems and how they process events um, relating to gravity and support, we showed them objects being lowered onto a platform. And the objects would either land stably on the platform or fall to the floor. And in both cases, the outcome was sometimes plausible, sometimes not. So on the left side, um, you're gonna see an asymmetrical object being lowered by a placer onto a platform. It's gonna be placed with only about 50% of the object in support with, in contact with the support. And because the object is asymmetrical and the heavy side is not supported, it's gonna fall over, which most adults would say is pretty plausible. In the right side, you're going to see the same object, but with minimal support, and it's not going to fall over. So this is an implausible scenario. We would hope if the AIs know what's going on here, they're going to recognize that that's not plausible. We got a lot of really just incredibly sweet compliments from the MCS teams when we just had our uh, PI, our final PI meeting two days ago in this very room. They were all uh, really complimentary. And there were two things in particular that they were really happy about. One was that we, the evaluation team, took a very non-adversarial approach. So we weren't trying to trick them. We were working collaboratively with them to try to help them develop their AIs um, so as to get better and better as the program went on. 
They really appreciated that. The other thing they really appreciated was the rigor of our experimental designs. Um, apparently, and I didn't know this, but I'm told that um, in the AI community, mostly it has been the case that AI systems are just asked to reach a certain benchmark. And you don't necessarily know why they succeeded or failed in any given case. You just know if they met the benchmark or not. Well, being experimental psychologists, my team and I decided that a good way to approach this would be the way we approach studies with babies. And that is to say, use the tools that are typically deployed by experimental psychologists. In all of our tests, we implemented balanced designs that allowed us to control specific variables of interest. And that yielded so-called factorial designs that allowed us to in, uh, independently manipulate these specific variables of interest, yielding these graphics um, that could represent the designs, um, in this case, in a three-dimensional way. And it's three-dimensional because there were three different variables we were implementing in this gravity support task. On the z-axis, we, we had some videos that were plausible and some that were implausible. On the y-axis, we sometimes gave the objects minimal support on the platform, sometimes a lot of support, and we could vary that systematically. On the x-axis, you can see we had some symmetrical objects, some asymmetrical objects that were unsupported um, on the heavy side and some that were unsupported on the light side. And so by doing it in this way, we were able to um, ask specific questions about when and why the AIs would fail where they would fail, and also where they, why they would succeed where they would su succeed. And um, this apparently was an innovation that the other teams found to be really useful. Yeah. I'm trying to understand the whole grid. How do you have full support, but non-plausibility? Um, yeah, that was a tough job for our um, developers to implement. They wound up creating these objects that had these weird centers of gravity so that the thing would come down, land on the thing, and then would just bizarrely, it looked really weird. Okay. Um, so they were things that as adult humans, we would all say it's obviously implausible. So yeah, it required us to find tricks around the real life gravity situations in our environment. Um, to give you another example, um, this was our design for the spatial reference task. And one reason um, our team started referring to these as hypercubes is because they weren't always just three dimensions. Sometimes they were four or five dimensions if we were manipulating more than three independent variables. So in this case, we needed two different cubes, one to represent um, all of the scenes in which two different agents were looking in the same direction, and another one where two different agents were looking in different directions because we wanted to see um, which entity the AIs would take their cues from. So we could manipulate things in a variety of ways, such as sometimes we would let the entities move, sometimes not. Um, sometimes the entities were familiar, sometimes they were novel. And so we could really dig into the data and figure out what was causing success and failure. So young babies are often tested using the kind of passive looking time methods that I told you about. But some studies use more interactive protocols, and DARPA wanted us to examine common sense capacities of children in the toddlerhood. So that gave us the opportunity to design some more interactive tasks. And we wound up designing a whole lot of interactive tasks in which the AI always has the same goal, and that is to retrieve a particular re reward object. And the reward object we chose was a soccer ball or a football if you are European or from some other non-United uh, States community. All right, this first example in our interactive object permanence test, um, we were able to design an interactive task that got at the exact same concept that we got at in our passive object permanence task, the very first one I showed you, but in a more interactive way. And so this allowed us to triangulate on the quote unquote conceptual competence of the AIs. Um, in this test, the AI finds itself on a platform, this white strip running down the center of the room. It can easily step off to the right or to the left, but once it's made a choice, it can't get over to the other side anymore. 
So that effectively renders this a forced choice task. The AI needs to pick the right or the left side. Um, a reward target is launched into the room and it comes to rest behind an occluder. And if the AI has object permanence, it should get off on the left because even though it can't see the reward ball anymore, it knows it's there and it should go behind the occluder to retrieve it. So unlike in the passive tasks where we're asking, is it plausible, is it not plausible? Instead, we ask, does the AI manage to retrieve the reward ball? Because of the controlled kind of hypercube approach that we had, where we were rigorously trying to test specific hypotheses, we had a control condition that looked like this, where the identical behavior happens for the ball, but instead it comes to rest not behind an occluder, so it can still be seen. And this is important because if the AI fails to retrieve the ball here, then its problem is not with object permanence, because it can see the ball, but with navigation or some sort of sensory motor competence allowing it to pick up the ball. It needs to succeed here in order for us to be able to evaluate performance on the previous video. If it does succeed here, but then it fails on the previous video, then we know that it really is having a problem representing the existence of the ball when it can no longer be seen. So let me show you some of our other interactive tasks. This is just a few examples. Yeah, yeah uh, question. So uh, how do you, uh, does AI know that it needs to retrieve the ball? Somehow? Yes, yes. Okay. That, that's like the one thing that we, there was no way around it. We had to give the AIs that command right up front, retrieve the ball. Yeah, and there were, we did um, 586 test situations, and in all cases, it was always the same thing, retrieve the ball. So yeah, we can do that. So um, each of the tasks that I'm gonna tell you about, I'm gonna give you five, even though that we did one more than this. Um, each of the tasks tests a concept that the research literature on human infants suggests babies or toddlers understand. Um, we had some arithmetic tasks. On the left, you're gonna see a quote unquote addition task where an occluder will come down, um, cover the back half of the room, and you're gonna see three placers come down, putting three balls onto the otherwise empty floor. If the AI can figure out that zero plus three is three, and that that's more than the two that they'd seen on the left side, it should get off the platform onto the right side and go retrieve the larger reward number, right? Subtraction is similar. You're gonna see four placers come down, remove all four of these balls. So that's supposed to represent four minus four. And if the AI knows that one is greater than zero, it should get off onto the left side of the platform and go behind and retrieve the ball. Um, we had a process of elimination task because the AI had had a lot of experience with the soccer ball in the playroom. It could have inferred that it could not possibly be hidden behind this occluder because that occluder is too narrow. And if it can do that um, understanding, it will get off the platform to the left side and go behind the wider occluder, which is the only one in the room that could actually hide the ball. Um, what you're going to see now is an actual AI, one of our teams, um, choosing the correct side and going behind the occluder and finding the ball. And uh, for the remaining three examples I'm going to give you, you're also going to see an actual AI uh, performing. We had a shell game where a, a reward ball was dropped into a container, lids would be put on the containers, and then a placer would come down and move it. And here this AI moving fairly smoothly, it went to the right one, um, finds the ball, even though it's not in the location where the AI originally saw the ball deposited, right? It was able to track the ball, even though the ball was not visible when it was being moved, right? Um, I mentioned the spatial reference task before when I showed you the more complicated hypercube design. In this task, um, we, in most cases, had two entities one of which was an actual agent. It was like a, a non-player character. And it was able to walk. It had a face. It had a variety of characteristics that were able to help it be identified as an agent. Our foil was this other thing that you see here on the left. It's a sort of ambiguous blob-shaped item that is not able to move itself. It has no face. It can move, but only because the platform that it's on rotates. 
And so you'll see it can be moved to a position. The agent in contrast can move itself to a position. And because the, the blob has this kind of proboscis, it can effectively point to one side of the room. The agent points to another side of the room. And if an AI understands that objects don't know anything, but agents do, theoretically, it can learn to only follow advice from a real agent, which it did in this case. It went to the left side of the room where the agent was pointing. Um, we had another task, um, an agent imitation task, where an agent... Can I just ask, have these tests been around with human babies and toddlers? These tests have been around with human babies and toddlers. They are among the tests that have been done with human babies and toddlers that I am very skeptical of. Mm -hmm. um, we had people on our team with very different theoretical orientations, and there were some on our team who believed that babies understand this sort of thing. And so we went ahead and did the tests because the literature suggests that they might understand these things about agents. I, I remain skeptical. There are some other studies that have failed to replicate them. So uh, in the agent imitation task, you're gonna see this agent um, the way the AI would see the agent opening uh, containers, in this case, first the silver one, then the gold one, and that releases a reward ball from the ceiling. The agent then steps back and the AI is given the opportunity to do whatever it wants in the room. And if it understands that there is value in imitating an agent, it might open up the silver container and then the gold container and be able to retrieve a reward ball. And I'll show you some examples later on of uh, actual AIs performing this task. So ultimately we tested um, 17,000 scenes. It was a really enormous study across the many years we were doing this. Questions so far? Are we doing okay? I mean, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, actually, I'll have a fair amount of time afterwards. Hopefully you can join us for lunch and we can talk about stuff. All right, so how is AI doing? Well, ChatGPT has obviously knocked the ball out of the park when it comes to natural language processing. Um, I recently asked uh, ChatGPT to write a short blurb about ISI in the style of William Shakespeare. And it said, oh, fair soul, let me spin thee a tale of information sciences institutes noble travail. In the realm of learning where knowledge doth thrive lies this institute where wisdom's currents connive. Tis a place where minds doth weave and wind. Are your minds weaving and winding? Definitely okay. every day. It's impressive, right? It's really amazing. Um, of course, this is you know, known to be ChatGPT's um, strength. If we're not looking for flexible behavior, the roboticists are also doing some amazing things. If you're willing to spend hours and hours and hours training machines to do something very specific, you can get this robot that Boston Dynamics got to do this um, remarkable obstacle course. Um, they got it to do this by training it over and over and over in this specific domain. Now, in the um, in the PI meeting that we this is real in video. Yeah, this is real video. These are physical 3D objects. Oh my God. They're amazing. Um, in our PI meeting, um, we saw some videos of robots that are much more flexible and they can do things not this impressive. Wow. <laughs> but still pretty, pretty impressive. Um, but these guys were were trained in a in a very um, and how much does one of those cost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would think a lot. All right, how about the um, AIs from the MCS program? Well, our AIs have a let's call it a more checkered performance history. Um, here are some of the common sense violations that we looked for and saw in our interactive tasks. Um, sometimes the AIs would not correctly identify the target objects. Sometimes their traversal paths would be really inefficient. I'll give you a, a, a qualitative example of that in a minute. Sometimes they searched in really inefficient ways, revisiting objects they'd already explored, and that was completely unnecessary. They would pick up and put down objects over and over and over again. Um, two days ago, <laughs> I saw an example of this AI that would walk toward the soccer ball. It would get to the soccer ball, and instead of picking it up, it would just do this. <laughs> Back and forth, right? So, you know, clearly not really very um, commonsensical. 
Um, here you're looking at uh, top-down bird's eye views of an AI behaving in a room. These are really early examples from August of 2020. And the dotted red line is the path that an AI was taking to a particular target. Uh, on the left, you see the OPEX AI moving in a really straight and efficient way. The MESS AI is um, not nearly as straight. It's kind of meandering. But honestly, that could be the way a baby or a toddler might move around a room. So it's not necessarily too weird. The core team, in contrast, is doing this thing that we wound up calling the chicken dance because <laughs> it makes no sense. We have no idea why it was behaving that way. Um, definitely not efficient. So Cora was the Harvard, the MIT one, right? Yes. Okay. Just checking. Yep. Um, <laughs> Skynet, it's not. That's a good thing. Um, I don't think we want Skynet. <laughs> All right, before I get ahead of myself and tell you much more about ways in which the MCS AI system succeeded and failed, let me give you a single extended example of the kinds of quantitative analyses that we had begun to implement by last year. And to do this, I want to consider the AI system's performances on our moving target prediction task, um, which we first implemented in September of 2022. We manipulated the three variables you see here, there are these things that we call poppers that are located in a wall that can shoot a, a target ball out into the room. And sometimes the target ball would be shot quickly and sometimes slowly. Sometimes the room would be free and clear and the AI could go wherever it wanted. But sometimes there was a very large pool of lava on the right and on the left. And there was only a simple strip down the center where the AI could safely uh, traverse. And so the AI's job was to calculate where the ball was going to be at some future point and get to that point in time to catch the ball without burning itself in the lava. Um, we had some non-lava scenes, obviously, for control reasons. And sometimes the ball was uh, straight across the room, but sometimes it was angled toward the AI, and sometimes it was angled away from the AI. I'll show you two examples of scenarios we presented and of how uh, the OPEX and the core teams, respectively, performed in these situations. The first one is going to be the OPEX AI in a room with no lava. Um, the throw is going to be straight and fast. The AI first looks around the room to orient, runs after the ball, and gets it successfully. Um, Cora, this is a more difficult task because there's a whole bunch of lava here. Our balls were, um, they had some sort of special armor that allowed them to float over lava safely. They didn't melt. Okay, um, and you see the strip there that is the only zone in which the AI can retrieve the ball and it gets it just before it goes back onto the lava field. Um, note that in the slides that follow, I'm not asking you to make much sense of the data you're gonna be seeing, just to give you an idea of what sorts of data analyses become possible when evaluation protocols are designed the way ours were designed. So first of all, we're able to generate overall performance metrics that are akin to um, kind of measuring teams against a benchmark. And note that in this case, only the blue bars rep represent the challenging experimental situation where there was lava in the room. The red bars are the control conditions. And you think that that should be fairly easy because you saw that the ball starts to slow down, right, for normal friction reasons. So you'd think that the AIs would be able to retrieve it almost all the time in rooms where there's no lava. But um, most of the teams succeeded uh, less than they uh, failed. The task was difficult. Um, Cora and Mess both failed as often as they succeeded, even on control trials with no lava, the red bars. The only team that ever successfully retrieved the target in more than 75% of the trials was OPEX, and that was only in the lava-free trials. Um, there was more failure than success when there was lava. I have a question. Um, was that just because the time limit that the lava would constrain uh, would would add? Um, because you had to capture the ball quickly. Yeah, um, yes. So the reason you see this disparity here and this disparity here is because the lava made the task harder for the reason you identified. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> What's, I had a follow-on question. Is there was it a function of the trajectory the ball took, or uh, that's a great question, and I'm going to get to that momentarily. Thank you. So, um, 
Thanks for the question. So we developed a data presentation approach that took advantage of our hypercube designs. We were able to represent the hypercubes in um, see-through colored kinds of ways where green cells would represent um, better than 75% correct performance in a given condition. Yellow is 50 to 74%, orange is 25 to 49%, and red is basically failure below 24%. Looking at each team's performance on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, we see that OPEX represented in the right-hand panel um, was especially good in scenes that did not involve lava. So those are these non-lava green cells in the back, right? And that makes sense. They did well in the, the non-lava condition. Um, MESS in the central panel found lava scenes to be especially challenging when the reward ball was thrown quickly and angled away from the AI both of which also make some intuitive sense. So you can see this red cell is that one where the ball is coming fast, there's lava in the room, and the ball is moving away from the AI. In general, each team had less trouble when the ball moved straight across the room, maintaining its depth relative to AI, than when it was angled. And so that's why we see green and yellow in the top four cubes, but more orange and red down below. Okay. Um, but we can also look at this in more traditional kinds of ways with bar graphs. Um, the analyses we did allowed us to examine the effects of the specific independent variables we were interested in, such as the effect of angle of throw. Did trajectory make a difference? Turns out that all teams found it more difficult to succeed when the target was thrown away from them. So those are the red bars, and that's why they're lower. So I think that's the answer to the question that came in on Zoom. Um, yes, the trajectory mattered. For optics and Cora, throws toward the AI were also more difficult than throws directly across the room. So these green bars um, here and here are lower than the blue bars, which is interesting because you think if the ball is coming toward the AI, it should be able to um, do better, but it was not able to do that. We could also look at the effects of speed of throw. Um, and you see that faster throws were really only slightly more difficult than slower throws. So speed didn't make as much of a difference as we might have expected. So I have a, was, yeah. I just have a quick question. Were these, uh, were the AI uh, from Cora and Optics and all of the mess, were they predictable? Meaning if you repeated exactly the same experiment, would you get exactly the same results from them? Or was there a component of randomness? And did your experiments account for that? Um, we, we did, um, run the same tests, um, on consecutive analyses. So six months later, we might do the same thing, but most of the teams were tweaking their AIs in that interim period, trying to improve them. So we never did the test that I think you're asking about where we had the same AI run in the exact same situation. So I don't know for sure what the answer is. I think I do not think that any of the teams were putting randomness into their systems that way, but I can't be sure of that. All right, uh, as it was in earlier evaluations, it's continued to be the case that qualitative analyses, like treating specific responses to specific scenes as kinds of case studies, uh, revealed that looks to um, revealed behavior that looks to most of us like it fails the common sense test. So here's a, um, a few examples I'm going to give you from what I um, collated. I call it the museum of not exactly successful. Um, I'm going to give you one from each team. First, Cora snatches defeat from the jaws of victory. You're going to see here's a room with no lava. There's no reason why. What? It was like right there and it doesn't pick up the ball. It just turns away and starts looking around. Not commonsensical. Um, here we have mess. Again, no lava, but the AI um, tracks the ball, starts moving toward it, and then sort of starts reaching for it. What you can see here is a log that we were able to collect showing what the AI was doing. Even though it looks like it's not doing anything, it's issuing pickup object commands. It's getting a response that says the object's out of reach. And rather than moving closer to the object, it just perseveratively continues to um, emit these pickup object commands, right? Nonsensical. Um, 
We had a, so, um, this, but it could be just a bug in the software that has nothing to do with the learning or architecture. Like that is possible, right? That that's possible. And so, you know, we like to think that as an evaluation team, we were giving the teams the kind of data that they need to help find these bugs and maybe fix them. Because you know, ultimately, DARPA is. Uh, connected with the Department of Defense and you need your systems to be bug free, right? But yeah, it's not necessarily about common sense. It could be a bug. Um, we had these kinds of analyses we did um, that we called scorecard analyses where we looked at specific kinds of things like number of steps the AI would take. And if the AI would move itself forward, that was a step, but it's also considered a step if the AI issues a command like pick up the object. And what we see here is that the Ness AI succeeded much more when it took fewer steps. When it was taking a lot of steps, it was failing. And that's probably because of the kind of video I just showed you where it's taking a lot of steps, but not actually doing anything. Oh, sorry to interrupt again, but um, uh, obviously we would want to compare against humans. Um, is there any sense you have about how many times a baby would fail? Um, there is... There are data um, in analogous tasks, mm -hmm. and we know that babies fail. It depends on their age, yeah. right? Um, they're much more likely to fail when they're younger than when they're older. Um, we had some developmental psychologists, particularly on the OPICS team from Oregon State, who tests that very sort of thing. But we never tested them in this exact same situation, so it's hard to do a, an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Yeah. But your point is very well taken. That would be valuable data to have. Um, all right, this is OPEX. OPEX is bailing on the scene prematurely. We often saw this, again, maybe a bug. Um, the AI looks around the room, ball is launched, and rather than continuing to move forward, the AI basically hits the ejector seat and, and leaves the scene and doesn't complete it. So it fails for no real clear reason. It's anxious. <laughs> exactly. Um, so here too, um, the scorecard data could be interesting. It's the exact opposite pattern that we saw in the NES um, uh, graph. Here we see a bunch of successes when the AI is taking more steps and a lot of failures when it's not taking many steps. Maybe that's because in some cases it was taking just a few steps and then throwing itself out of the scene. All right, but it's not just all bad news. There were some remarkable successes. The AIs typically generalized to novel stimuli pretty well. Some of the team's approaches yielded AIs that were remarkably good at some of the tasks, scary even. So um, on the left, you're gonna see uh, Berkeley team's AI doing really well at the imitation task. It sees the agent open up the green container, open up the blue container, then steps back and coming at it from a different angle, the MES AI still knows that it needs to open up the green then the blue, ball comes down and the AI is able to get it. So I think that's a really impressive piece of behavior. In the next one, you're gonna see OPICS also succeeding, but for a very different reason. In this case, the agent opens only the black container, the AI looks around, starts moving toward the situation, but instead of opening up the black container, it seems like it doesn't know what it's doing. And then it realizes, hey, wait a minute, I saw the ball up there. I can just cheat, right? It doesn't, I don't need your stinking imitation task. In some way, I consider this to be evil genius common sense because um, you know it's not supposed to do that, but it did. And in some ways that's super clever. <laughs> All right, um, in general, I'd say the AI has provided evidence that algorithms can learn to behave as if they understand the underlying concepts we were testing, like object permanence, how objects are affected by gravity and other objects, how information from agents can be used, how to navigate and orient. But they're still far from the intelligence we see in adult humans. Why? Well, for one thing, psychologists don't have a single agreed upon definition of intelligence. It's not even clear to us what that is. For another thing, there's the problem of the long tail. So an autonomous car that is trained on scenes that are encountered in Los Angeles might get really good at recognizing dogs, cats, deer, mountain lions, other things we see around here. But it's not gonna recognize this kangaroo escapee from the Los Angeles Zoo, because it may never have encountered these things. It's a wallaby. 
Is it? I think so. Okay, <laughs> well, okay. Thank you. Um, so, you know. Humans good at it. Yeah, yeah, right. So uh, we are better than the AIs, though, generally. Like, we can look at these kinds of scenes from Google Street View, which shows that bizarre things happen all the time, and human <laughs> beings don't really fritz out when we see these things. We might scratch our heads and be like, what is going on here? But it's not going to make us crash, whereas AIs often really fail at this sort of thing. Also, it's one thing to understand a concept, and it's another thing to actually function in an intelligent way in the real world. There's this old story about Marvin Minsky, um, who some of you might know about. He gave a, the story goes that Minsky gave a freshman a pro summer project in 1966. He said to this freshman, I want you to attach a camera to a computer in order to get the computer to be able to see things. Now, as we all know, the problem of computer vision still remains unsolved 50 years later, because vision is exceptionally complicated. Sensation is intimately tied to perception. Perception is intimately tied to cognition. And you can't just solve the lower level problem of how light interacts with a, a retina and you know, wash your hands and say, solved. Ultimately, it's become apparent that the tasks that seem like they would be easy are very, very difficult. And the tasks that AI theorists originally thought would be hard, like playing chess or winning a Jeopardy, turn out to be among the easiest tasks. And um, do you guys know this is Moravec's paradox? Okay, some of you have heard, heard this. Moravec was one of the first people to identify this in 1988. He wrote, it's comparatively easy to, take, to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers, and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. Steven Pinker, in his characteristic way, put it more succinctly. He said, hard, hard problems are easy and easy problems are hard. Uh, Moravec had a way of trying to understand this. He noted that because of the billions of years of evolution that have allowed us as organisms to perceive and move in the world, we're all prodigious Olympians in perceptual and motor areas. So good that we make the difficult look easy. Um, abstract thought, though, is a new trick, perhaps less than 100,000 years old. We've not yet mastered it yet. It's not intrinsically difficult. It just seems so when we do it. So perhaps in retrospect, we should have expected the big breakthrough to come in the language as it did in ChatGPT. This language is an evolutionarily newer kind of competence than uh, walking around in the world. In contrast, the failures of the MCS teams in the non-linguistic domain should maybe not surprise us. The task that was put before the MCS teams was in some sense, literally as simple as child's play, but it turned out to be incredibly challenging. So I'd say that we've clearly underestimated infants and toddlers and the remarkable development that they undergo very early in life. The upshot is the current AI still leaves a lot to be desired. Um, this is Yejin Choi. Um, she was an MCS performer and won the MacArthur Fellowship uh, a couple years ago. She just recently said, AI today is unbelievably intelligent and then shockingly stupid, which is definitely true. Um, large language models like ChatGPT often make shit up. They typically provide only superficial analyses that's lacking in insight. They don't actually understand anything at all. Everything they know they learn from the internet, which as we all know is not necessarily the best source for accurate information. And the kinds of experiences we all have as we develop, the experiences that give rise to our common sense are much richer than the text on the internet. And it's even worse out there in the realm of um, non-linguistic functioning. Our AI sometimes performed well, but they typically failed at one-shot learning. So they can't encounter a new situation once and have good ideas about what to do in that situation. They certainly don't create metaphors or process metaphors the way we do. They have no empathy, no inherent curiosity. They're burdened with the biases of their input sets. They lack any understanding of human values, norms, and morals, woefully lacking in common sense. So what's a poor defense department to do? Um, why is it that AIs are so devoid of common sense still? Well, it remains an open question whether or not um, the machine learning methods that are based on artificial neural networks even have the potential to get us to AGI or artificial general intelligence. Um, recently, we've seen a move toward combining these kinds of um, 
models based on uh, neural nets with more old fashioned symbolic networks. Um, and that seems to be a move in the right direction. But I think most of our MCS teams were still using neural nets to solve the problems. And, um, and these crunch huge data sets to find patterns that can be exploited to make reasonable predictions. Um, and in so doing, deep learning neural networks like this are using something akin to inductive learning or inductive reasoning. But people don't work like this. We use experiences along with contextual information to make intuitive probabilistic guesses about the things and events we encounter using something more akin to abductive reasoning. So I think we might need an entirely new approach. I've given this talk many times before, and it always comes in at about 50 minutes. But it is now 12 o'clock, probably because I took some questions. Um, do you guys need to go? Should I stop? Or do you want to hear the last 10 minutes? What should I do? Keep going. Keep, keep going. So, that's, yeah. that's OK. All right. Um, personally, I think DARPA was smart to take Turing's 1950 idea seriously. If you want to build a machine with common sense, you should start by studying the only entities ever known to wind up with common sense, namely babies. But I think DARPA misstepped when they started off out very early on by getting nativists involved in the development of the MCS program. When I talk about nativism, I'm talking about psychological nativism, which is the idea that our mental capacities and structures are innate rather than acquired as a result of experience. And when I talk about development, I'm not talking about economic or other kinds of development. I'm talking about biological and psychological development. I'm talking about this little bit of miracle, right? All right. If you prefer your um, developmental miracles more of the human variety, I'll let you watch this super cool little video um, that was generated by an artist in uh, the Netherlands who took little clips of his daughter um, as she developed up to the age of 20 years and strung them all together. Mm -hmm. So you can see development unfolding here in front of your eyes. You can check that out while I ramble on about development. Uh -huh. um, nativists think we're born with what they call core knowledge about, for instance, objects, places, and agents. And because nativists helped to define the vision of the MCS program, they were inclined to think it would be good to build certain kinds of knowledge into systems, like knowledge about objects, places, and agents. But I think if you want a system to develop common sense the way babies, children, and adolescents ultimately do, you shouldn't give it knowledge. You should give it processes that lead to knowledge. So rather than designing systems that know about gravity, collisions, occlusion, and the like, we should, in my humble opinion, be designing systems that attend differentially to different stimuli, because that's what babies do. We should be designing systems that act on the world using a body to explore the effects of those actions, which will actually help them learn about themselves, which none of the um, AI systems in the MCS program are doing. We should be trying to develop AI systems that are intrinsically motivated by and are curious about novel stimuli in their environment. Notice here that I'm talking about, I have a bunch of verbs underlined, right? It's because these are processes rather than a noun, knowledge that's just put into the system. We should be developing AIs that seek attention from human interactors, because that's what babies do, that discover the affordances of things and situations in the world. I think we'd be more likely to succeed if we develop AI systems that get aroused that play, that guess, that get bored, that babble, that spontaneously draw, that imitate. There is so much that's distinctive about human babies and how they operate that could plausibly lie at the root of the development of human common sense. But to the best of my knowledge, no one is coming at this problem from that kind of developmental direction. From my perspective, it almost looked like the performers, um, the TA1s on the MCS project, we're not even trying because they seem committed to hammer, hammering away at the project using only the tools currently at our disposal, such as reinforcement learning paradigms and neural networks with recurrent or convolutional architectures. The problem with this idea that we can use development to um, make better AI is that there's nothing at all like biological development that's going on in AI systems. And it's not clear how you could program that into a machine. On the other hand, birds are very different from airplanes in significant ways. 
And just because an artificial system doesn't work in the exact same way as a biological system doesn't mean the artificial system isn't useful. Artificial systems can still be useful to us, both as tools themselves and as models of biological systems. So for example, even though the neurons in our brains are dissimilar from the nodes that constitute neural networks, AI systems inspired by neural structures have already proven to be a tool that can be quite valuable in some circumstances. And we can also learn a lot about how things work in nature by studying analogous things that we've built. So just as AI developers can learn from developmental psychology, psychologists of all stripes can learn from research on AI. Ultimately, I am probably gonna to continue to think that developmental processes are a crucial ingredient that's currently missing from efforts to make AI better, but it remains to be seen if I might be right about that. So thanks to you all um, and to a whole bunch of people who helped me uh, get to this moment. I'm only five minutes late, not too bad. I'm happy to take any questions anybody has if you have time to stick around and ask them. Uh, yeah, I can ask another question. So, uh, did uh, so AI agents were not um, uh, aware of a particular task uh, or of specifics of a particular task before you tested them, but uh, could they uh, use the information gained from prior tests on completing the future tests or no? So, um, we didn't constrain how they did their um, training at all. So, they could train their AIs in our playroom environment, but they could also train their AIs out in the real world. Um, I don't know what exactly each team did for their training. They did know some basics about what the tests were going to look like because they would not let us um, test them without any knowledge. It, it would have been, there would have been too much failure. Yeah, I'm asking how the tests themselves were conducted. So let's say you run a thousand tests on AI agent. Mm -hmm. And before that, uh, teams got some information about the test, but they didn't know what the test looked like exactly. Right. Say uh, the agent completes the first test. Could it use the information it gained from the first test on no. completing the second test? No, good question. No, um, once the team submitted their AI, that AI did not change. So it did not learn during the tests. Right. What's that? Thank you.